As of the time of this recording, it is Sunday, July 8th. This is the second edition of the Sneed Bumble Tech Podcast. I am Sneed from Sneed Bumble Tech. Welcome back to all of those uh, that are returning subscribers and viewers out there. If this is your first time visiting the channel, welcome as well. Thank you all for stopping by. So the goal of the podcast is to take just a handful of topics and really delve into them, uh, truly dissect the items, uh, different things that I've selected as that I feel are pretty relevant in today in terms of whether it's smartphones or it's particular you know, carriers or anything like that, cord cutting, things of that nature. Um, really get into those because the videos that I upload throughout the weeks, you know, they don't get into too much detail. There's just a limited amount of time that I choose to put into those videos. So this podcast is you know, able to do that. It's a platform that allows me to get into the details and um, a lot of the specifics of these different topics. Uh, so topic set number one, we're going to go with hardware. We're going to start with some Apple news and rumors. So we've got some pretty solid rumors now on the iPhone catalog for 2018. Uh, looks like we're going to be seeing three different devices. Uh, one's probably going to be the replacement for the iPhone 10. We're probably also going to see an upgraded version of the iPhone 10, which is going to be like an iPhone 10 plus. So it'll be larger, a little bit more. Um, you know, high-end when it comes to design and features and things of that nature. Uh, and then we're going to have a budget-minded phone, uh, which could be coming in a wide variety of colors. So it's it's pretty well understood now that we're going to be seeing uh, things like the color gray, white, blue, orange. You know, I've been hearing a lot of these things. It kind of reminds me of maybe what they did with the iPhone 5C, uh, which would make it a more affordable option. You know, the iPhone 5C was, was a lot cheaper than the iPhone 5S, uh, so they definitely had a dichotomy of cost there. Uh, it was made of plastic. Uh, it was definitely budget-minded, and I think a lot of kids really, um, you know, were the main customers of that phone, parents buying them for their children. And, and this kind of, this is kind of conflicting because, you know, I've read article after article about how, you know, iPhone and, and Apple designed their phones as, you know, these, these really high-end, premium-featured phones when it comes to design and build, you know, a cheaply appearing plastic-type phone wouldn't make any sense for Apple at this point, seeing that most people view iPhones as being status symbols and, you know, signs of achievement and wealth. I mean, there's all types of different things out there that, you know, the way people describe what they perceive as being an iPhone. Uh, so this particular budget device is going to be uh, 6.1 inch display which will be LCD in nature so we won't be seeing an OLED panel uh, the cost is uh, rumored to be at about $700 uh, so much more affordable compared to the iPhone 10 or any iPhone 10 plus that's also going to come out uh, it's also estimated that the LCD model could account for 55 percent or more of the new model sales now I'm not sure if that's going to be the case that's just a prediction from someone but um I mean, if it is more affordable, that that makes sense. More people can get their hands on it. Uh, the iPhone 10 Plus variant could be a dual SIM variant. Uh, could be, you know, exceeding the cost of thousand dollars or more. So, seven hundred dollars to thousand dollars. Obviously, more people will be able to afford that. So, we'll have to see what those devices look like and what the pricing is going to be. And we should know more about that within the next couple of months. Uh, now, shifting over to the image that you guys see there casted on the screen. Uh, global smartphone sales in terms of best-selling models worldwide. So the iPhone 8 has taken over as the best-selling smartphone on a global scale. The S9, the S9 Plus, which are pretty much the competition for Apple, uh, sales have been pretty low relative to expectation. So pre-orders for the S9 models were a lot lower than expected. Overall sales have been below expectation. Um, I guess, you know, the sales have been way below previous you know, S models, I think this is dates back all the way to like the original generation of the S and the, you know, the, the S2 and S3. I mean, it goes back pretty far. So, you know, the expectation was that the S9 and S9 Plus were going to outsell the S8 models and the S8 models sold 38 million models last year. So that would have made the S9 and S9 Plus a very highly selling model. So I'm not really sure what it was in particular about the S9 or S9 Plus that it didn't sell as well or even pre-order that well. Uh, maybe it was, you know, a combination of a few things. You know, I, I kind of speculate sometimes that, you know, maybe it's the TikTok, the TikTok upgrade cycle where people see that the newest generation is just a small iterative upgrade and it's not worth it to upgrade. So if you just spent 700 or $800 on a phone, 
you're not willing to just buy the next generation uh, if you don't feel like it's a big enough upgrade. So they saw it, similar design, not much for added features that were different, you know, so they just passed on it. Uh, maybe it's also the S10 excitement. Uh, a lot of people are hearing a lot of great things about the S10, new technologies, new features, and they're just kind of holding off to wait to spend the money on that phone. Um, and like I said before, maybe it's just little to no change between the S8. There just isn't you know much there to want to upgrade. So uh, go ahead and take a look at the the screencast there. What you have on the screen it kind of shows which phones sold best globally. And you see that the iPhone 8 you know really took a, a strong hold towards the last six months, doing very very well. Now Apple's also not satisfied with their numbers. Uh, you know they this this would kind of be more of a recovery than a win for Apple as iPhone 8 sales were really slow at first. Uh, but Apple has high expectations. I'm not really sure why they're tripping in this case. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe the sales were initially too slow for them and they were worried. Uh, maybe it didn't meet market expectations. I'm sure investors are always trying to, you know, make sure numbers are higher and higher every time and every, every generation. Uh, but definitely not too shabby leading the global smartphone sales in the model iPhone 8. Uh, so... Actually, oh, and one more thing to add uh, coming from Apple. So um, the rumors are pointing uh, to the next generation of iPhones, since we were just talking about them, that there's going to be a very small incremental performance increase for the next generation of iPhones. So they're saying that there's only going to be like a 10% improvement in single core benchmarks and only a 5% improvement in multi-core performance. These estimations would make this the least improved leap in performance ever by Apple iPhones. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what exactly that means. To me, it just means that the last generation of iPhones were really, really fast and ahead of their time, and the new ones up and coming aren't making a drastic leap in terms of performance. You know, 5 to 10% is not very marked, but... I mean, it's still an improvement. It's not like Apple's just sitting on their laurels, not doing anything to improve it. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in terms of other rumors about the next generation of iPhones, uh, I'm hearing that there's going to be some additional RAM that's going to be added to the models. Uh, so, you know, some of the models that were, um, you know, two, gigabit, two gigs of RAM are now going to be seeing three gigs of RAM, and then three gig of RAM models are going to be four gigs of RAM. So they're obviously improving the hardware enough to the point where they can actually do more. Um, they're going to have increased cache and data capacity, you know, three and four times more. Uh, iOS 12 is going to see a huge boost in performance improvement, uh, better stability, improved speeds, more reliability. Um, but, you know, this is just kind of the way the smartphone game is. We see the TikTok upgrade cycle, you know, year to year, small incremental improvements. This has been a legit problem in smartphones now for many, many years. This dates back, uh, you know, the last eight to 10 years, really. Uh, so trying to generate revenue from generation to generation, making sure they upgrade it just enough to get you to, to upgrade and buy the new phone, uh, but not doing too much to where it's... Uh, you know, not cost effective. They want to continue to make those small improvements and try to milk the game as much as they can. Uh, last little bit from Apple. Uh, Apple's going to be going away from Intel for their SOCs and their modems. Uh, the previous rumor was, uh, I'd say, I don't know, maybe two or three months ago, we kind of caught wind of this, but now it's pretty much confirmed. Apple uh, will be starting to go in a different direction in 2020. They'll be going a different route when it comes to their Bluetooth and Wi-Fi hardware. So the initial story broke earlier this year, and it definitely implicated more than just smartphones. It was just Macs uh, at the time. I remember reading the articles and sharing it with the channel. Um, now we're seeing that the future of the smartphones is unknown. Uh, this is kind of interesting because with 5G networks kind of being on the horizon, who's going to be providing Apple with the 5G modems for their devices? Um, you know, who's Apple going to go with? Are they going to try to do something in-house, you know, uh, try to develop their own? Are they going to go with some other manufacturer? I know Qualcomm could potentially be an option for them, but, you know, Apple has pretty much said we want to be res less reliant on Qualcomm and other manufacturers for this. Does that mean they're going to use Samsung, you know, with the Exynos chips? You know, I, I don't know. Samsung's already making their displays, so the partnership is there. Uh, they're making the OLED panels for the iPhone 10, and I'm going to assume some of the OLED devices that we see this year. Uh, so we'll just have to wait and see what Apple does with respect to uh, the hardware that they use in their phones and their computers.
All right, shifting over to Samsung a little bit, we're going to talk here about the Note 9. This is just rumors and developments, so I uh, made a video last week. I actually think it was on the podcast. Uh, the big thing for this year's version of the Note 9 is going to be the S Pen. So it's a huge feature of the device. It's definitely more than a stylus. It definitely was pretty much a stylus at first, but in the evolution of the Note 9, uh, making the S Pen more feature-ish and uh, capable, um, you know, they're probably going to go ahead and take it a step further in this year. So, uh, you know, we're hearing that Samsung's going to be utilizing Bluetooth technology implementation into the S Pen. So incorporating things like digital signatures and other really cool features with the S Pen. So uh, some of the things that are potentially going to be able to be done with this Bluetooth S Pen, you know, things like remotely taking photos, using, a, uh, using it as a pointer during presentations, authentication features, you know, making playback uh, on music. So it's not only a stylus, but it's really going to be many of the cursor type features. Uh, being that it is going to be Bluetooth means that it is going to need power. So how are they going to go about providing the power in terms of charging it? It obviously is going to need a power supply, so it's going to need its own battery, you know, being a standalone device kind of. So how's it going to have its own connectivity? How's it going to stay charged? How's it going to be certified? On August 9th, we're going to get a lot of answers to this, um, probably leading up to the this launch date as well. Uh, we'll hear a lot of rumors and stuff like that. So. Um, August 9th is going to be the big day for this device. Samsung will be holding an unpacked event uh, with a launch soon to follow. There will be some pre-orders and then it will make its way into stores. So we'll probably be expecting more leaks, um, you know, more case imaging that will probably show the S Pen ejecting and how it works. Uh, so we'll be definitely expecting that uh, probably in the next couple of weeks in July here. Uh, now the Note 9 is going to be an expensive phone. It was 950, 960 bucks last year, depending on the carrier you bought from, or if you bought it from Samsung directly. You know, you start adding features like this, and you're probably looking at something like a thousand dollars, pretty much right off the bat. Last year's model was 950, 960. Add an upgraded S Pen, you know, dual cameras, three cameras, whatever it is, you know, it could definitely exceed a thousand dollars. So definitely expect a premium device. All right, so let's see what we have here. So we've been hearing rumors of this, and, and it was just you know pretty much speculation at the time, uh, but now we actually have some confidence in this. Uh, Samsung is going to be dropping three models of the Samsung Galaxy S10. So last week's podcast, I mentioned the code names Beyond Zero, Beyond One, and Beyond Two. Um, these three different models are going to be packing a lot of new features for the S10 lineup here. The Zero would be, what we're hearing is, the Mini model, which to me sounds like it could be a compact device of some sort, or it could be like an entry-level device, which is a little bit more affordable. Maybe it's budget-minded. Uh, budget Samsung Galaxy S series could definitely be attractive to somebody who's maybe on this budget. Uh, you know, Maybe it's 650, 700 bucks, and the other ones are a lot more expensive. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what this mini model offers. Um, apparently all three models are going to have fingerprint scanners on the sides of the device, which is you know, very contrasting from what we've been hearing. Um, previously there were a lot of rumors that the fingerprint scanner was going to be built into the display, but I think that's not ready for prime time. So that's really unfortunate news. It was going to be this really cool feature, but it just doesn't seem like either the supply of it isn't ready or the technology of it just wasn't ready. So who knows? Maybe we'll see next year's Samsung Galaxy Note 10 possibly have the in-display fingerprint scanner at that time. So, you know, the, the problem with the side fingerprint scanners at this current moment is they're really expensive. So Samsung's going to be paying, I think, $15 or more to have this type of a fingerprint scanner embedded into the side as opposed to somewhere on the front or the back of the device. So, you know, these S series devices are going to have new features. They're going to have more expensive hardware. They're definitely going to be at a higher price point. So previously, I've always said that the S9, S8 models, they were affordable relative to flagship prices. This one probably isn't going to be as affordable. So, you know, maybe they'll be 700, 750, but I'm thinking probably closer to $800 when you start.
expect probably their flagship device to be launched or announced. Uh, so the Moto Z3 Force, we're expecting it to be called. And also we're expecting a budget-based phone, a more affordable device called the Motorola One Power. Um, maybe there's going to be some mods, maybe there's going to be some battery technologies, some camera stuff, some, some attachments, things like that. Um, but in terms of the event, it will be held in Chicago. That's where Motorola's uh, United States headquarters is. Uh, these devices are launching after the Moto G series from earlier this year. Uh, and the Play series already came out, so we've already seen. Uh, you can watch lots of reviews on the Moto Z3 Play. But we haven't heard anything from the flagship, and we've been seeing leaks and rumors about this One Power. Uh, so we don't know much about the device. We haven't heard anything. Uh, it's been pretty skimpy for Motorola, so... We don't know if there's going to be any partnerships with Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T and Sprint. Uh, maybe it'll be similar to what they did with the Z2 Force from last year, which was a great phone. Uh, you know, we don't know if they're going to be selling it strictly through the Motorola website. We, we don't know any of these things, so we'll have to wait and see. But um, something which is really unfortunate is Motorola's always charged more through their website to sell the phones unlocked than to buy at a carrier. Samsung, on the other hand, sells their phones cheaper compared to carriers. So it's just, you know, I've noticed that. It's just weird. I, I don't understand why it's so different. Um, so I don't know. It's just something I've noticed recently. All right. And some sad news. Very, very sad. Uh, so HTC is apparently laying off 1,500 members of its workforce. Uh, specifically, I think the department is going to be the manufacturing side. So this is in total about 25% of HTC's entire workforce. Uh, this is their attempt at cost cutting. Operationally, they're doing really, really bad. Uh, they've been operating at loss for a very, very long time. So year over year, uh, there's been tons of financial disappointment. They've been losing money, hemorrhaging dollars for many years. This is horrible news. It's been trending this way for a while, so it's not new. Uh, but HTC used to be a top-tier Android manufacturer. They made great hardware. Their phones were excellent. Uh, people bought their devices with confidence that they were getting, you know, a flagship device that was built well and performed well. Uh, but you know, over the last you know several years, it's just it's been a downward spiral for HTC. Uh, so you know, they used to be this top-tier Android manufacturer. And now they're, you know, an afterthought. Um, even last year, they they lost carrier partnerships. So they couldn't even get their devices into carrier stores here in the U.S. And if you can't get into carrier stores, you're not selling your phones in the U.S. Most people buy their phones from the carrier. You know, they try them and check them out in the store, and then they make their decisions. So if they're not in the stores, they're not selling. Uh, so they lost all their car uh, carrier partnerships. No support in those stores. Online sales have been poor, so even buying through HTC Online hasn't been good for them. <clears throat> um, I mean, I, I just, I go off of the eye test. So what you do is just kind of casually, you know, look at what types of phones people are using and what they're holding in their hands. And you'll see, when was the last time you saw an HTC 10 from like two years ago? When was the last time you saw last year's HTC 11? Or when was the last time you saw an HTC 12, their new flagship, the 12 plus? I haven't seen these phones in the wild ever. And I'm around people with a lot of smartphones. It's kind of weird that I don't see these phones. So they're pretty much, I mean, their smartphone department is its pretty much done. Uh, the HTC Vive segment, their VR section hardware is doing really, really well. You know, I'm not sure how long this is going to continue, how long the Vive will do well, but they're pretty much investing and putting forth all their resources into that end of the hardware. Um, you know, HTC built the first two generations of the Google Pixel. Uh, well, they so they built the original Google Pixel and Google Pixel XL, and then last year's Google Pixel 2, they also built that one. LG built the Pixel 2 XL. Uh, so they've been manufacturing quality devices, um, but you know they're not slated to be building the next generation of Google phones. So now they're not only selling their own devices, but they're not even manufacturing for Google. And a huge chunk, a huge piece of HTC's design talent and research and development was bought by Google and, you know, just basically swiped away from HTC. They sold their talent. So 
you know, and, and Google looks to be building its own hardware here. There they're, looks like they're going to be contracting Foxconn for the next generation, the third generation of the Google phones. So HTC is probably not going to be making smartphones much longer. I don't know if we're even going to see another flagship device from them or even any budget-minded devices. So uh, pretty much a sad development. It's been bad for a while, but they've been hemorrhaging dollars, and financially they're just they're, it's, it's bad for them. Uh, so the next topic set, this is going to be just some random stuff. Uh, that I just wanted to inform you guys of. So eSIMs, electronic SIMs. So everybody pretty much knows that in order to get LTE connectivity, you know, get a network, use your smartphone, you need some form of a SIM card into the device that, you know, will give you a network that's operational. So now we see with the eSIMs, which is a new technology, um, it's going to be replacing physical SIM cards uh, from the hardware end to an actual electronic SIM. Uh, it does offer remote connectivity, so no need for in-store activations. Uh, this is pretty big for smartphones and other connected devices, including you know the Internet of Things, IoT applications, and stuff like that. I know Project Fi has already been using these. They started using them last year with the Pixel 2 models, uh, both the smaller one and the larger one. So uh, I know Apple has been using eSIMs with one of its iPads and its newest Apple Watch, and I think Samsung's already using them with the Gear 3 smartwatch. So, you know, I could see that this would be a positive and a negative uh, using the eSIMs. So the negative side uh, for like carriers and, and retailers, they're probably going to see a higher customer churn rate. Uh, people, you know, coming and going through different carriers. This would definitely increase because of this. So moving from carrier to carrier is going to become much more easy to do. Um, but the advantage is, is you got connectivity over the air. Uh, there's no in-store management required there's you know just a simple database for registration and activation uh, so the operations on that standpoint are really really good mvnos are probably going to generate the most benefit here uh, customers of prepaid are going to really love this uh, for anybody that's ever dealt with like boost prepaid uh, metro pcs their activation policies their operations and registrations are an absolute nightmare you know cricket as well uh, it's painful, it drags on, you're on the phone forever, long phone calls, wait times, you know, long extended chats, things like that. I mean, all that kind of goes out the window with eSIMs. So I'm excited for that development and that technology there. All right, and the last thing I'm going to leave you with is a personal rant, and I'll just end it uh, with this pretty much. Um, smartphones are getting boring. And I think a lot of people uh, definitely feel the same way. The market's become saturated with pretty much the same old thing. Lack of innovation, small iterative changes. You know, from generation to generation, people don't feel the value in upgrading to the new device, the new generation of device. Um, it's just, it kind of stinks. Uh, the upgrades are less appealing. People are just doing it less. So the phones have become so cookie cutter. Uh, no changes, no uniqueness. It's kind of like follow the leader. One successful phone does something and then everybody starts to kind of do it. There's a lack of customization. It's just, you know, I just, I kind of ask like all the time, like how often does somebody feel compelled to really upgrade, you know, outside of brand loyalty, like with the iPhones, like the iPhone 6 and 6S and 7 and 8 and 10, you know, they've got their loyalty uh, from their customers. But like, take like the Galaxy S line, the, Gal uh, the Galaxy Note line, uh, all the Motorola devices, the LGs, the G6, 7, the V10, 20, 30. You know, think about the pricing. You know, how how are you going to be upgrading when these they're selling you these phones for seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, a thousand dollars? Is it worth it? Is the camera upgrade worth it? Is the performance upgrade worth it? The features, the software, the hardware appeal, the design. You know, which manufacturers are going to give your money to that you feel deserve it? based on doing more to make you want to upgrade and go their way. So uh, I guess what I, I would just want to kind of, you know, inquire with others here on the channel is who's going to be upgrading this year and, you know, which phone are you going with and, you know, basically why, you know, what is it about a smartphone that makes it compelling enough to want to upgrade? And the last little bit of uh, news here, I'm sure some of you use Netflix. Netflix is actually using... Uh, a new pricing tier. Uh, the media platform is experimenting with a premium tier service that includes some uh, high-end features that no other plan has. 
um, pretty much what they're doing is they're going to be including 4K video resolution and HDR video in this new high-end premium tier. Uh, so the current premium Netflix option, I think, is priced at $14 per month. This service is going to come in at $17 per month, so $3 above uh, the previous premium uh, plan. Uh, I guess what they're trying to do in this case is trying to distinguish it from the premium plan. I'm not really sure what they're doing with this particular plan, other than the fact that it just they might be offering one or two features for the extra $3. Uh, so current planning, I think they have the base the standard, the premium, and then this would be the ultra plan, which would be demanding the higher price point. So, I don't know. You guys can kind of look at it here. Uh, you've got all the different features for the different plans. You've got base, standard, premium, and then you have the ultra there. So, you can see that they're, they're all pretty much HD except for the base. Uh, the ultra HD is available in the premium plan and then the new ultra. Uh, the HDR is only available in this new plan and then the number of connections that you could have like the number of devices on the account is four which matches the premium so the only distinguishing feature is the HDR I'm not really sure if a lot of people are gonna want to pay the extra three dollars just for HDR like is it that meaningful to someone to upgrade from you know for the extra three bucks to get that feature uh, I'm not really sure how well the premium plan is even selling because most people probably don't have a 4K TV or whatever. So I'm not really sure what exactly they're going for, but I just wanted to kind of update you guys on that plan and what they're offering. So that pretty much wraps up the podcast here on the Steam Mobile Tech channel. Thank you all for watching. Go ahead and drop me a line in the comment section below. Any topic from the video is fair game. The interaction is most definitely the best part of the channel. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's there. Um, remember, I will be doing a weekly video podcast moving forward. You can catch them on my Patreon page first, getting early access to it, so be on the lookout for that. Weekly live streams are every Friday with a starting time around 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is more of an open forum for discussions on various topics. I'll have a few topics that I'll raise, and you guys can pretty much ask me whatever you want. Uh, we could delve into the news from the week, and we'll have you. Uh, I'll have some answers for you, hopefully. The last live stream was great. I was about two hours long. It was a lot of fun. It's a great time. I enjoyed it very much. So again, thank you guys for all of your viewership. Video updates coming early this week. One of the topics for the week will be Boost Mobile and prepaid implications for the T-Mobile and Sprint merger. It's an exciting time here on the channel. Video podcasts, video live streams, video updates. The mobile landscape is always changing and evolving. The second half of 2018 is going to be a hot one with a lot coming from carriers. And of course, we're moving towards 5G rollouts from the big four, so stay tuned for everything. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Ding the bell to get notified when new content is uploaded. Check out the Patreon page and consider joining and tri contributing. Just search Sneed Mobile Tech on Patreon. Shout out to David Brown, my first patron. You are the man. Thank you, and I appreciate it greatly. Please consider a PayPal donation. Link in the description below. Help support the channel. That's pretty much it. I hope you guys had a great weekend and a good 4th of July. This is Sneed from Sneed Mobile Tech. Have an excellent day, and I will see you guys on the next edition of the Sneed Mobile Tech channel. Take it easy. I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Peace.